So in computer science and computer vision, we often encounter the need for motion detection. So for example, I have a surveillance system, a homegrown surveillance system to monitor key entry points around my home. So what this setup consists of is several units, each of which has a Raspberry Pi 3 with a Pi camera. And every minute or so, each one of these surveillance units sends an image to a centralized MQTT broker hosted on a more contemporary Raspberry Pi 4, a higher performance device than the Raspberry Pi 3 that I use as a server to host the MQTT broker. And then on the Raspberry Pi 4, I have a Node-RED workflow, which aggregates all the images from all the surveillance cams and displays them in a nice gallery. Now with this basic framework in place, I want to add some smarts. For example, I want to detect motion and I want the system to alert us when motion is detected. I also want to detect a person in any of the images using AI. So how to detect motion in a reliable manner in Python? I, I will show you in this video using the PIL module that can be very easily installed on a Raspberry Pi, even older versions that are much cheaper to buy. And know that there is a much more powerful Python module, OpenCV, but installing OpenCV on a Pi is a bear. And I opted to go with PIL, which will always work on any Pi and is relatively light. So in this video, I'll break down the recipe and walk you through the steps using Jupyter Notebooks. I have developed the software in three steps. In the first step, I coded the functionality in a Jupyter Notebook until I was satisfied that I had a reliable method of detection. In the second step, I refactored the code into a module with a motion detector class to use in my surveillance framework. And in the last step, I wrote another Jupyter notebook with various test cases from no motion to moderate motion to extreme motion to verify the performance of my system. Let's start from the end and let me show you the six step process. In the first step, I take two images, call them baseline and compare within a second of each other. In the second step, I compute the difference. Now, ideally, the difference between two images should be zero, right? Unless there is motion. Alas, real life is not that simple. So I clean up the image using a technique called thresholding, which pushes individual pixels to zero or max, depending on the threshold value. Note that this happens in each of the red, green, blue channels. This is a color image. In the fourth step, I apply image processing techniques, erosion and dilation to improve the signal to noise and create this black and white mask. Erosion followed by dilation 
will enhance the information in an image and suppress the noise. I also convert the image to black and white. Note, not grayscale, but black and white. Now, this looks more like the difference I expect when there is no motion, right? All the info in the image is in the foreground. Where do you find these regions, these clumps of pixels called connected components? The more of these and the larger they are, the more likely that there is motion in the image. Another way of saying the difference is non-zero. Now note that the steps like thresholding will also filter out effects like camera stability and lighting changes to improve the signal to noise ratio in this analysis. Now, the only remaining step is to identify the connected regions to assess motion. And so in the fifth step, we identify, count, and rank order the connected components. The sixth and the last step is applying some logical rule to call out motion. The one I used is if the top five connected regions are each greater than 90 pixels in size, then there is motion. So this first case that I'm showing you has no motion. For moderate motion, I seated myself in front of the camera and waved my hand at the camera lens. This process reveals more connected components and they are also larger in size. And for the extreme case, I walked in front of the camera. You can clearly see that this approach is efficacious in detecting motion. So this is the six step recipe. Now let's look at each step in the implementation. In the setup, I use the Pi camera module to acquire images, NumPy for storing image data in a multi-dimensional array for processing and mathematical operations on these arrays. PIL for some image analysis, especially the use of image filters. Matplotlib is for plotting in the Jupyter Notebook. At the very outset, the function take motion snap accepts as arguments the width and height of an image. And in the output, it returns an array of the, specif of the specified width, height in three dimensions, one for each of the red, green, blue channels, color channels. In the body of the function, I also configure camera settings, such as the resolution, the rotation, exposure mode, etc. The Pi camera, for some reason, inverts the image. It is flipped on its head. So rotation, 180 degrees sets it right. The function shows snap, accepts an array as an input. This is an array in three dimensions, width by height by three.
it will plot the image in a manner suitable for viewing in a Jupyter notebook. Called take motion snap with the width and the height 300, 300. Save the result in test and pass test to show snap. And we see the picture. Note that show snap has stuck a customizable title above the picture and a default label with the image dimensions underneath. Next, take two motion. The function take two motion will now take two pictures, one after the other in rapid succession. Take two motion accepts as argument the time interval in seconds. And it uses take motion snap with the specified width and the height to take a picture. Once it has taken two pictures, one after the other in quick succession, it will return three arrays, the first picture, the second picture, and then the difference between the two. Each array is width by height by three. Call take two motion. I have passed one second. Save the results in baseline, compare, and test diff for the first image, the second image, and the difference between the two respectively. Now use the show snap function to examine the difference. Now a simple motion detection algorithm you may argue, could just consist of counting how many pixels are different between baseline and compare. Looking at the difference image though, I'm sure you'll agree with me, this makes a compelling case for why this will not work. The difference is typically too noisy for motion detection purpose. So for this reason, we'll continue processing the image further. In the next step, we will apply an image analysis technique called leveling, where we force a pixel to zero or max, depending on a threshold. What this achieves is it filters out the effect of say camera shake or lighting changes. PIL has no built-in method for thresholding, but it is easy to implement with NumPy. In fact, it is just one line of code. Call threshold difference, which accepts an optional argument for the threshold. I have set a default value to 50 for my RGB images with 8-bit representation of color in each color channel. Note that in this implementation, the threshold will be applied independently in each color channel. Use show snap to view the result. Now it may not look like much, but without this step, our motion detection results would be vulnerable to camera shake, lighting changes, etc. Next, we'll proceed with erosion and dilation to enhance the signal over noise in our image. Fortunately, PIL has an array of filters and min filter and max filter we can use these functions, these methods from PIL 
for erosion and dilation respectively. So the function erode dilate accepts one argument, snap, which is a PIL image object and returns a NumPy array, which has the cleaned up image, the enhanced image in black and white. In the body of the function, I execute one cycle of erosion followed by dilation and then convert the image to black and white. Now we can use multiple cycles of erosion followed by dilation if necessary. However, I haven't found it necessary in this context. So call erode dilate, having converted the NumPy array from the previous step into a PIL image object. With erosion and dilation, all the information in the image, the signal, if you will, is in the foreground. So it makes sense to convert the image to black and white. Now this looks like the image we would expect to see after subtracting one picture from a nearly identical version of itself, right? So now what remains is to assess What remains now is to assess from the foreground whether there is motion or not. Looking at the image, we find pixels clumped together, forming regions called connected components. Statistically speaking, our null hypothesis is there is no difference between the two images. And the alternative hypothesis is there is a difference which we ascribe to motion, having eliminated other probable causes like camera shake or lighting changes. So basis what we see in this black and white image in front of us, we must assess, is it statistically significant the difference in which case we reject the null hypothesis, accept the alternative and there is motion or not statistically significant, in which case we accept the null hypothesis, reject the alternative and there is no motion. So we'll do this hypothesis test on the basis of the, how many connected components there are and how large. Unfortunately, PIL has no method to count connected components. But counting connected components is a staple in computer vision. There is a wonderful instructional video by Aaron Becker on YouTube that explains the two pass algorithm in which we raster scan the image twice to identify, count, and size connected components. Since there is no method available in PIL, I have implemented the approach, the algorithm by hand. You can read through the function and the explanatory notes if interested. The function find connected components accepts one argument, an image array of the black and white picture. It returns an array 
of the exact same size with numeric labels uniquely identifying each connected component. Call it mask. It also returns a dictionary where these labels are keys and the size of each region in pixels is the value. Having identified the regions, the connected components, in the final step, we can filter the dictionary to select regions above a certain size threshold and then rank order them. Okay. I've used a size threshold of 90 pixels. This is 0.1% of my image size, 300 by 300 is 90,000 pixels. 0.1% of that is 90. For detection now, I've used a heuristic rule. If top five regions greater than 90 pixels in size, if there are more than uh, five regions that are 90 pixels in size, then there is motion or the top five regions together accounting for 900 pixels or 1% of the total image size pixels in the image. Tell me there is motion. So in conclusion, this is my six step process. Take two images in rapid succession one after the other. I have chosen image size of 300 by 300 pixels. Then calculate the difference. Then level the result on some threshold. I have used a threshold of 50. Use erosion followed by dilation to enhance the signal over the noise and then convert the image to a black and white image after one cycle of erosion followed by dilation. I found it sufficient to use one cycle of erosion followed by dilation. Then identify the connected regions using a two pass approach. Count them and rank order by size. We can then call motion based on how many connected components there are and how large. And capture that in some simple rule, like 5% of, like the top five connected components are each greater than 90 pixels in size, or put together the top five connected components represent more than 5% of the image. And this is the recipe for motion detection that I have found works very reliably. Having established this approach in the last step, I have converted it, it into a Python module with a motion detection class. Both the module and the class are called motion detector. The implementation uses the code from the Jupyter notebook. There are a number of helper methods for each step in the six step process. These have names beginning with underscore. The core method is this one called sense. Here is where all the heavy lifting happens. 
using the helper methods. So sense takes two snaps, calculates the difference, levels the result by applying a threshold, then applies one cycle of erosion followed by dilation, converting the result to a black and white image, identifies, counts, and rank orders connected components, and then reports the results. Which brings us to where we started. To use the motion detector module, import it like any other Python module. Create an instance of the motion detector class. The defaults will work just fine. And then invoke the sense method. In these few lines of code, you have all you need for detecting motion. I have tested this approach in a variety of scenarios, no motion, moderate motion, and extreme motion. I have found that it is sensitive to motion while also robust to nuisance variables like lighting change, etc. Follow the examples in the Jupyter Notebook to remix in your own app. Motion detection is just one of the features I need in a surveillance system for home security. Another key feature I require is object detection to tell what was the cause of motion. Was it just a tree waving in the wind, an animal passing by like a bird or a deer, or another person? This is especially important when we are away from, away from home, at work, or in travel. I have developed an implementation of object detection using deep learning on a Raspberry Pi. I have implemented object detection with deep learning on a Raspberry Pi that's coming up next. I have implemented object detection using deep learning within the constraints of a Raspberry Pi, an older model Raspberry Pi. That's coming up next. <laughs> 